Well, I want to thank you for joining me today on this Tuesday. It is a beautiful day in Pittsburgh, so I'm sorry my hair is a little bit wet and stringy. I just got back from a, a 35 mile bike ride and had a wonderful time outside and I hope you're enjoying this season as well too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for joining us in our Bible study tonight on this Tuesday, the last Tuesday of this Easter season. And we just give you thanks for the privilege and the opportunity to gather here today. And bless us with your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we uh, continue with our lessons from the book of Acts as we have during the season of, of uh, Easter. And as I mentioned to you, this is our last Tuesday in the season of Easter. I hope it's been a blessed Easter celebration for you. It certainly has been for me. It's a reminder again of the great love that God has for us. And this is kind of a nice transition into this coming Sunday's lesson, which is again from the book of Acts, the emphasis of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. However, this lesson actually takes place after they've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we kind of have them backwards, but that's just kind of how the lectionary works. Um, we, they, want us, they want to focus today on something a little bit different. It's kind of an odd lesson. So let me start with this. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers. Together, together the crowd numbered about 120 persons. Now, that number is actually kind of significant. Um, there is always in the Bible this desire to have these numbers, these wonderful round numbers. In particular, anything that deals with the number 12. 12 is kind of a significant number if you think back all the way to the Old Testament. Let me see. How many sons did Abraham have? Um, let me think. Are you thinking about that? I'll give you a hint. That's right, 12. So therefore, how many tribes of Israel were there? Um, hmm, give you a hint. Oh, that's right, 12 tribes of Israel. And then, let me see, when the book of Revelation oftentimes talks about the 12, uh, 12 walls and the 12 this and the 12 that, everything's in 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. It's kind of an important number. So, not surprisingly, when Jesus decides that he is going to pick disciples, he doesn't pick 10. He doesn't pick 10. He doesn't pick 8. He doesn't pick 6. He doesn't pick 20, he picks 12, because this is a very biblical number. And so when it mentions 120 people gathered around who are followers of Christ, that's 12 times 10. You still get that 12 in there, that nice round number. There could have been 88, maybe there was 105, maybe there were 140, but the point is it gets to this numerology type of thing. I don't mean this in, in, in terms of... Um, well, it is kind of mythical, a mythical type of number, 12, I guess you would say, in the Bible. And so it re represents, again, that leadership that God has placed over top of the nation of Israel and over this new thing that God is trying to do. The problem is the disciples are one short. They're down a guy. Remember what happened to him? They only have 11 right now. That's a problem. If you're going to get up to number 12, you've got all these 120 other people to choose from. We need to get back to 12 to represent again that mission of God that God wants to take to the world. Okay, so what are you going to do? What happened to that 12th guy? What was his name? His name was Judas. Now, it depends upon which gospel account you read. That will determine how Judas is viewed. John, in the gospel, John absolutely despised Judas and just had a, a non-ending side comments and sidebar comments about how much he loathed Judas. And you'll notice that in the Gospel of John. But Luke, Luke on the other hand, is a little more sympathetic towards Judas. Judas was kind of caught in an uncomfortable position. He wanted Jesus to do more. And he wasn't sure how to force Jesus to do more. He wasn't certain if his giving up his life for these last three years was worth it, and so he wanted to test Jesus, and he figured, well, if Jesus is who he says he is, then there's not going to be any problem for him. He's going to be brought before the scribes and Pharisees, tried and tested, and he will prove to them who he is, and we'll get back on track. That's not what happened. What happened? Jesus was killed, executed. I don't think at all. There's no evidence that that was Judas' intention, to see that Jesus was executed. But Judas couldn't live with himself and with that guilt. So what did he do? 
killed himself. I find that sad because I think we should have more sympathy towards Judas. I think if Judas had just lived another couple of days to Sunday and seen the resurrected Jesus, his life would have been transformed and Judas would have been the greatest apostle of the church. I'm convinced of that. You want to know how I know this? Here's my evidence. On the night in which he's betrayed, what did Jesus do? He took bread, he broke it, and he took some of it and he dipped it into the wine. That's called the sup. The host of meal would then take that sup and hand it to his most honored friend, the person he loved the most. Who did Jesus hand it to? You getting an idea here? How much did Jesus love Judas? Knowing what Judas was going to do, he handed him the sup. Judas, I know what you've done. I know it's too late. The wheel's been set in motion, but I still love you, and I'm beckoning you. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Jesus never gave up on Judas until the very, very end. So I'm, I'm outright telling you, John was wrong. Luke has a better view of who Judas was. Judas, unfortunately, was caught in his own mechanization, didn't know any way out. He killed himself. And so now the disciples are 11. And they need to do something about that because, again, that 12 represents that leadership that's going to be necessary to take the gospel to the world. So what in the world are the apostles going to do? Let's get on. So in those days, Peter stood up again amongst the believers, 120 persons, about. And he said this, friends, the scripture has been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was numbered among us. He was allotted his share in this ministry. So even Peter is not harsh. He spent three years with Judas. They loved each other. Everybody knows the sad story of what happened and how he betrayed Jesus. But there are no harsh words by Peter towards him. He goes on. So, one of the men who have accompanied us during all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken from us, one of these people, so in other words, one of the followers of Jesus who were not numbered in the 12. Remember, Jesus had 12 in the inner circle. 12 in the inner circle. That doesn't mean that he didn't have more disciples. He had hundreds of other disciples who maybe didn't follow quite as closely. But 12 were his most intimate friends. The, these were the leaders of the leaders, I guess you would say. So Peter is saying, we need to choose somebody from that group who's been a faithful follower of Christ, somebody who's known him. And what are they going to do? They're going to put him in Judas' place. Okay? One of these must become a witness. And so, again, this is, this is an important word. A witness. Their primary concern is that the good news of what Jesus has done is disseminated into the world and they need help this is good news remember the last few weeks we've been looking at witnesses to the gospel in particular the book of acts how peter would stand up even at the threat of death and give a testimony to the faith that he had in jesus christ and what it is that god has done we need help he's saying so we need a 12th person so they prayed and they said lord you know everyone's heart Show us which one of these have chosen to take the place in this ministry of apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own way. And so they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. So now they're back to 12. Matthias now is a witness to Jesus Christ, to the resurrection. He is an apostle. Remember, that's what the word apostle means. It is somebody who is a witness to the resurrection, was a disciple of Christ, and became a witness to the resurrection so that Jesus' name might be made known. Well, what does this lesson mean to us?
it's not tied up in the number 12. And I, I get it. The, you know, these things are important numbers. It's not even necessarily Matthias. But the point is simply this. The witness of Jesus to the world is the primary purpose of the church of Jesus Christ, that Jesus might be made known. You see, churches, congregations, who spend their time worrying about how they're going to pay their bills, how they're going to keep their walls up, are they going to have enough people for choir practice and for their cantata, wonderful things, all of them are. Are they going to be able to have a viable youth group? None of this is a part of what the church is about. I mean, the youth group, that's important. I get it, we have a youth group too. But it's the witness of Jesus Christ that we just keep going to person to person to person and making sure they have an understanding of Jesus. And you saw how Peter witnessed to Jesus it wasn't a harsh thing. It was simply that you need Jesus. He will touch your life. He will walk with you. This is what Jesus has done for me. So I'm encouraging you to develop a witness. That doesn't mean picking up your 50-pound King James Version of the Bible and bashing people over the head about what they have to do. No, what it means is simply this. How has God touched you? How has God blessed your life and transformed you? This is your witness because this is your interaction with Jesus. What has he done for you? Oh my goodness. Jesus has blessed me with life. I had such a privilege today to ride my bike for 35 miles and I met a young man named Stephen along the route. And we rode together for 10 miles. And he shared about the excitement, how bicycling changed his life. Because he was a depressed young man. And he was very sad. This, this pandemic came along and he didn't know what to do. He turned to bicycling and it saved his life. Well, that's a witness of sorts. is a witness to what bicycling has done. is a witness to what can being outside can do. Well, it's an opportunity for me to witness. Oh, man, that's just such a good thing. God has been so good that we are healthy enough to be outside here and enjoy this beautiful weather. And people have so desperately needed to, something to crash into their lives and give them something purposeful and meaningful. So I didn't bash him over the head, but we shared a moment there where he understood that my joy in life had to do with my relationship with God. His joy in life had to do with turning to nature and being outside. Well, that's a step closer to Jesus, don't you see? He didn't need indictment. He just needed encouragement. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad that he found something worthwhile. And there's so many wonderful things, including a relationship with God. That's a witness of Jesus. So I'm encouraging you, develop your witness so that you, when you have the opportunity, you can with such kindness and gentleness tell people about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And then the church goes on. We continue in an unbroken chain that witness of those early apostles and this world is touched. Let's give thanks in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again that the witness of Jesus has gone unbroken for 2,000 years. And we're not going to do it today. We're going to just put in another chain in that witness and keep developing that beautiful chain to witnesses to the love that God has for us. And so I thank you for those opportunities I have to give a, just a little witness, a little testimony to the hope that we have within us. I might never see Stephen again, but it's that little seed that you just plant of hopefulness, you turn him so that when maybe bicycling fails him, he has somewhere else to turn. May you bless this world with Jesus as you have blessed us. 
Use us, God, to be your hands and your feet, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go be a witness to Jesus Christ. Amen.